and it raises a particular, both particular and also universal questions of cultural and culture and identity. Questions that, uh, as the program suggested, are becoming increasingly urgent in today's very globalized world. Uh, born in St. Kitts, he was in, in the West Indies, he was raised in England, but has lived in the US for about 20 years, I think. He published nine novels, five essay collections, four stage plays, as well as many radio plays. That's a form we don't see a whole lot in the US, but it's been vibrant for many years in the UK. Uh, two of his film screen, screen plays have been produced, most notably the Merchant Ivory production of B.S. Nichols The Mystic Masseur, which won the award for best screenplay at the um, at the um, Mar del Hotel, this is my time, the Mar del Plata Film Festival in Argentina. Uh, he's a regular contributor to The Guardian and The New Republic, and his most recent essay collection, which is uh, available uh, back there, is Color Me English, Migration Belonging After 9-11. Carol Phillips won this award in the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, and the Commonwealth Writers Prize. He was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature in 2000 and the Royal Society of Arts in 2011. <laughs> and so tonight's talk is going to be explore the special tensions and difficulties of being a colonial migrant arriving in the mother country. Uh, we hope to stay afterwards for wine and hors d'oeuvre and it was a good conversation. A recent reviewer in his reading wrote that, quote, Philip's mode is one that arrives at insights, but gently. As readers, we are privy to what he thinks and wonders about, and we're inclined to join him in the process. So I invite you to join him here in person tonight, and please welcome him. Thank you. Um, is this microphone on? Is it working? You can hear me? Okay, good. Um, uh, obviously, I, I want to first and uh, most importantly thank uh, Professor Bird, who invited me to come to the University of South Florida with the, um, the kind of tantalizing uh, opportunity to um, step out of my normal departmental bunker, which is the English department, and meet people from different departments here uh, in Tampa, uh, creative writing, and drama, and Africana, and various other people uh, doing different aspects of the humanities and it's been a really truly terrific week. I've enjoyed working with the different professors. I've appreciated the way in which they've prepared their classes um, and I've particularly enjoyed meeting uh, students both graduates and undergraduates so thanks a lot for the invitation and it's, it's been a, a great pleasure um, when on, on Sunday, when I, I was driving from the airport to the hotel around the corner, and I turned on to Fowler, um, and I drove however long it is between the highway and here, not you know, a couple of miles at most, it seemed to me that pretty much uh, the story of America was on both sides of the road in terms of the number of different migrant groups that were represented in the shops and the restaurants and the food outlets. Uh, it, it truly was a, a kind of uh, real display of migrant America on both sides of the road as I was coming towards the hotel, which pleased me no end because uh, one of the things that I'm most interested in is migration. Obviously for personal reasons because I'm a migrant myself. Um, but a lot of the fiction and non-fiction that I write is concerning migrants. Um, and tonight I'm, I'm going to talk, I think, probably I think I've just been trying to figure out how long this will take for about half an hour about a particular type of migrant, actually the type of migrant that I am, um, which is a colonial migrant, um, which is slightly different from most of the migrants who arrive in the United States of America. Um, it's a, it maybe doesn't seem like it, but it's a quite a personal talk in the sense that it was motivated by thinking about my parents and my parents' generation 
and the difficulties that they had um, assimilate in, into British society. Uh, I won't say any more, I'll just read it and then maybe in the q and I'll expand upon that a little bit. So the talk is called The Burdensome Expectations of the Colonial Migrant. There's a moment towards the end of the Trinidadian writer Samuel Selvon, his short story which is called My Girl and the City, where the migrant hero, who's adrift in the cold and somewhat hostile city of London in the 1950s, somewhat surprisingly begins to declare a profound love for the city. Once again, he says, I'm on a train returning to the heart of the city from the suburbs and I look out of the window. The train crawls across the bridges, dark steel in the darkness, the thoughtful gloom of Waterloo, Charing Cross Bridge, the River Thames reflecting lights and the silhouettes of the city buildings against the sky of the night. When I was in New York, Many, many times I went into that city late at night after a sally to the outskirts. It was lighted up with a million lights as New York always is, but I never had a feeling such as I have on entering London. That migrants should have a hard time adjusting to a new city is not surprising in the slightest, but that they should have a hard time yet continue to feel a powerful affection toward the city is somewhat surprising. But this is not just a feature of this writer Samuel Salvon's work. It's true to the experience of many immigrants to Britain who have spoken or written about their feelings of affection for their new cities. As an immigrant, twice over, once to Britain, and then again to the United States, this question of how, indeed why, one might feel affection for a city in the face of overwhelming evidence of rejection has always interested me. Thinking about it has led me to consider that there are, of course, different types of migrants, just as there are different types of cities. And tonight in this talk, I want to consider a particular type of migrant who is now actually something of an endangered species, the colonial migrant. The writer Samuel Salvon was born in Trinidad in 1923, and he went to London as a 27-year-old man in 1950, and he was very much a colonial migrant. Trinidad was a colony. Independence didn't come until 1962. Furthermore, my parents, who came to Britain at the end of the 50s with me as their hand luggage, they too were colonial migrants. If you look around the streets of London or Paris or Amsterdam, you will see colonial migrants from the Caribbean, from Africa, from Asia, but you'll also see a far greater number of political and economic migrants from all corners of the world which is, of course, what we're familiar with here in the United States of America. At least, officially, we don't have colonies, so we don't have colonial migrants. However, these colonial migrants are the people that I want to consider briefly in this talk, for they do have a very peculiar relationship to the cities to which they migrate, and their experiences can best perhaps be instructive about the migrant experience in its broadest context. I grew up in Britain at a time of great social unrest and upheaval. My generation, the children of colonial migrants to Britain, had no great love for the cities that were our home, for we felt that they were rejecting us, and much to the distress of our parents, we played out our frustrations with violence and rebellion on the streets. Our disaffection was palpable. But I also grew up in Britain, not just as a frustrated, non-white child of immigrant parents. I also grew up as a lover of literature. 
and on encountering the writing of Selvon and others, I was always puzzled by the affection for Britain that was expressed by these colonial migrant writers. Clearly, I thought, these old guys had a problem. Couldn't they see that the city, in fact, the country, didn't like them and didn't want them? Why on earth were they then trying so hard to belong when the overwhelming evidence was that they would never belong? I'm going to try and look at this question of belonging to a city through the prism of two cities which lie on important rivers. I'm going to look at Leeds, a northern working class city in Yorkshire, which was a city to which my parents migrated, and London, the largest city in Europe, and one which needs little introduction. I have a claim to be able to call both of these places home, should I choose to do so. But maybe by looking at the story of one migrant, in the case of Leeds, and one extraordinary novel of migration, in the case of London, I'll be able to steer the talk toward the heart of my own feelings about the way in which colonial migrants deal with these vexing issues of belonging and participation once they've made the courageous decision to cross the water and try to stitch the narrative of their own lives into the larger narratives of the cities to which they have traveled. Let's begin with Leeds. I left the city in the 70s to go to university. However, the formative years of my life were spent in Leeds. I learned to read and write there. I went to my first schools there. I learned to love soccer there. I went to my first music gigs there. I went to my first pub there. I began to understand who and what I was in the city. I mentioned that Leeds is in the county of Yorkshire, which is not just a geographical description. By mentioning this fact, I'm also signaling something about the parochialism of the environment in which I grew up. Yorkshire is a very insular county. The ethos of us and them is strong. And when I was a boy, the county's sense of being its own place was reinscribed by all sorts of clumsy mechanisms, perhaps the most potent of which was the fact that you were forbidden to play cricket for the county unless you were born there. Mercifully, this has now changed, but as a youngster growing up in Yorkshire who loved sport, but who wasn't born in the county, this, this barrier to participation was a daily reminder that in some way, I simply didn't belong. I was an outsider. There were other more potent signifiers of exclusion, but as I said, I loved sport, and this particular policy of exclusion stung. In the late 60s in Leeds, an event took place which cast a long shadow over the city and sadly earned the city I called home national notoriety. A young Nigerian-born migrant to the city, David Oluwali, was found dead in the river, which is River Air, which is the river which flows through the center of the city. Upon closer examination of the events surrounding his death, it was discovered that for many years this poor man had been systematically harassed by the Leeds City Police Force. As a result of this discovery, his death was soon being investigated as a criminal offense. However, before going any further with the story of David Oluwali, it's perhaps best to put these events into some kind of brief context by looking a little at the history of Leeds as a city and as a city of migration. By the mid-19th century, the population of Victorian Leeds had swelled to 150,000, and as a result, in 1847, a huge Gothic prison was built to cope with the ever-growing numbers of so-called undesirables. In 1858, Leeds was able to flaunt a new town hall, one of the largest civic buildings in Europe, a place that was impressive enough for Queen Victoria herself to open. Industrial Leeds in the 19th century was thriving and continuing to grow. 
the four bold words that are carved around the vestibule of the town hall, Europe, Asia, Africa, America, reminded the people of Leeds that the globe was a true sphere of influence for the British, and Victorian Leeds was perfectly positioned to take advantage of this fortuitous fact. The making of cloth was of vital importance to the town's economy, but Leeds was also becoming very well known as the workshop of the world. Hundreds of factories produced bicycles and cranes, sewing machines, trains, axles, bricks, and much more. And while Leeds gave to the world, she also took from the world. By the late 1840s, a small community of middle-class German Jews had established themselves in Leeds, but the Jewish migrants that followed in their wake were largely poor Jews from Eastern Europe. They would arrive at the port of Hull in the east and make their way to west to Leeds in the hope of finding some kind of occupation in the clothing industry. Many were skilled tailors. And then there were the Irish, thousands of them, who arrived in the wake of the great famines of the 1840s. The Irish, the Jews, and then later the West Indians, the Indians, the West Africans, the Pakistanis, the Poles, and many others would come. Immigrants flowed into Leeds and slowly took their place in the order of things. But life was never easy for any migrant group. Of course, people were discriminated against. People were stared at. They were made to feel that they were the outsider, made to feel ashamed of who they were. But Leeds offered one thing, <coughs> one thing that everybody wanted and was prepared to pay the price for, opportunity. In Leeds, there existed the possibility of transforming oneself from what you were into what you hoped to become. In this sense, the city was a place of magical possibilities, a place with jobs and potential. To arrive in grey, grim, bleak Leeds was actually to arrive at a place of hope. And so they came. In 1949, David Oluwale arrived in Leeds. A young 19-year-old boy, he stowed away from Lagos in Nigeria and landed at Hull. In those days, an arrival in Britain as a stowaway was immediately rewarded with a mandatory 28-day sentence. It transpired that the courts in Hull decided that the young lad, who harbored ambitions of becoming an engineer, should serve out his sentence in the imposing Victorian structure that was the prison in Leeds. Upon his release, David Oluwali found digs near Leeds University and he began working at the West Yorkshire foundries, which was a place that made car mouldings for top-of-the-line models. During the evenings, he began to study, and some kind of a routine was established. He was a quiet man. He kept himself to himself, although he liked dancing and the camaraderie of the pub. However, he wasn't much of a drinker, and at the end of an evening, he liked to walk home by himself. It's probably worth emphasizing that a colored immigrant to Leeds was a rare thing in the immediate post-war years. According to the 1951 census, there were only 107 West Indians and 45 Africans in a city with a population of half a million. Unfortunately, the extremely visible David Oluwale soon found himself attracting the hostility of gangs of young louts and the Leeds City Police Force. However, what made this Nigerian different from the others was that he would answer back. And Oluwale consistently failed what the police called the attitude test. And I'm sure you can imagine what this was. By the early 50s, David had racked up a series of court appearances and convictions on minor trespassing and disorderly conduct charges and he'd returned to prison on numerous occasions. However, he was not a man to be broken by this treatment. On June the 11th, 1953, the system found another way to control the 23-year-old Nigerian immigrant, and he was committed to the subtly titled Yorkshire 
pauper lunatic asylum just outside Leeds. Thereafter, he was sedated and underwent electroshock therapy treatment, which during the eight years in which he was incarcerated radically changed the young man's personality and his sense of himself. Upon his release, David Olawali had nowhere to live, so he took to the streets of Leeds, a city that was now the only home that he knew. Predictably enough, he was subjected to even more harassment from the police, who made it clear that they didn't want this black vagrant on their streets. He was regularly, re regularly removed from the city centre, he was beaten, and he was left on the outskirts of the city by the police, sometimes in woods, sometimes in neighbouring towns, but he always made his way back on foot right into the city centre. Clearly, some of David Oluwali's problems could have been solved if he had either found a route for himself or else left the city altogether. But he was stubborn and independent. People tried to help him, but he wanted to do things his own way. And so he continued to wander the streets of Leeds and remain visible, which left him in constant danger of being terrorized by members of the police force. On May the 4th, 1969, a Leeds police frogman recovered David Oluwadi's body from the River Eyre, some three miles east of the city center. As the policeman pulled the body from the river, he noticed a large lump on Oluwadi's forehead, bleeding from an eye, a bruise on the right upper arm, and the fact that the man's lips were cut. He had drowned, that much was evident, but it was apparent that this man, who had a profound fear of water and who couldn't swim, would not have voluntarily jumped into the river. Two years later, a trial was held which resulted in the imprisonment of two Leeds City Police officers for assaulting the immigrant. In the absence of any witnesses, it wasn't possible to try either policeman for murder, but the details of the case and the sentencing of the two policemen received national attention and shocked the people in Leeds. In the late 90s, I found myself back in Leeds quite regularly, often doing journalistic pieces or speaking at the university. I took these occasions to walk around the city center and to retrace the route I used to take as a schoolboy, trudging my way across the town from my city centre bus stop to school. On one of these visits, I was taken aback to realise that the very doorways that the homeless David Oluwali sought shelter in were the very ones that I used to walk by. Some quick calculation soon revealed that I'd only missed seeing him by a matter of months. He was killed just before I started secondary school in the center of Leeds. He was, however, a very large part of my upbringing because skinheads and racists would regularly taunt me and other non-white citizens with the promise that we're going to do to you what we did to Oluwali. As a young boy in Leeds, the name of David Oluwali was both a warning and a threat. During one of these trips back to Leeds in the 90s, I went into the Leeds City Library and I looked at the contemporary newspaper reports of the events of the Oluwali trial. I won't go into all the details of what I discovered, but I will say this. I went into the process feeling sorry for this man who had been brutalized and who'd lost his life. I saw him as a victim. However, when I came out the other side of the research, and the writing, I realized that yes, of course, he was a victim, but he was also much more than this. He was a supreme representative of the tenacity and the courage that all migrants have. He was a man who could have saved himself if he'd simply left the city. He would almost certainly have survived. But David Oluwali was determined. At dawn, beaten and bedraggled, this man would walk back into the center of Leeds and go to the very same shop doorways that the police officers regularly found him in. He would make himself visible so that his presence in the city was actually an open act of defiance. I will 
participate in the narrative of your city, whether you like it or not. I will be a part of your city. In the end, this Nigerian migrant paid the highest price possible for his tenacity. One final point. It's worth remembering that to date, the David Olawale case remains the only case in Britain where the police have been successfully prosecuted in a situation where a citizen has been unlawfully killed whilst in their custody. That this happened in my city during my lifetime still causes me distress. But it obviously also tells me something about the courage of migrants and the difficulties that they have to navigate when finding new cities. And what of London? Around this time last year, I found myself spending the greater part of a week in a replica of a boat that was modeled on Conrad's boat from the novella Heart of Darkness. Just to confuse things a little, the boat was moored on the roof of the Queen Elizabeth Hall on the south bank of the Thames. Mm. This replica boat was actually an art installation that was part of the Olympic year of cultural celebration in London. Twelve writers from around the world had been invited to spend some time in the boat, one writer each month, and write about whatever took their fancy, what they saw, how they felt, in short, whatever was on their mind as they perched in this boat come hotel room high above the river. The view was magnificent. To the left were the Houses of Parliament, in front the Savoy Hotel, to the right St Paul's Cathedral, and further around the bend in the river, the Tower of London. However, I can't really say that I much enjoyed my time up there, perched high above the River Thames. The first night was strangely eerie. It was a night punctuated by unfamiliar sounds, screeching seagulls, wires stretching and singing, wood creaking and popping and snapping, the swishing backwash of water, the occasional dull bass of a tugboat. At dawn, I was rewarded with the drama of light crashing through the flimsy blinds and the dramatic announcement of a new day. I crawled out of bed and once again took in the extraordinary vista of a 180 degree view of London as she curves around the graceful bend in the river at the heart of the city. I immediately began to think of T.S. Eliot, an American migrant to London, who in the wasteland wrote memorably of the unreal city of London. Unreal city, under the brown fog of a winter dawn, a crowd flowed over London Bridge, so many. I had not thought death had undone so many. Hardly cheery words, but that foggy, poetic image of London was strangely enough what I expected to be gazing down upon. I anticipated endless lines of people shuffling across bridges to the left and to the right, with, as Eliot suggests, each man fixing his eyes before his feet and silently going about his business. But that's not the London I saw before me from my elevated vantage point. The fog of the first half of the 20th century has long gone, and I didn't detect much shuffling. In fact, in early 21st century London, people appeared to be dashing purposefully in all directions. But preconceptions are powerful, and we often hold on to them long after reality has intervened. Between 1948 and 1962, over 250,000 West Indians arrived in Britain. British citizens clinging to suitcases, gaudy hats, and with their passports of belonging tucked neatly into their jacket pockets. They were coming to the motherland and their minds were full of the images of the empire's most important city. Marble Arch, Buckingham Palace, Hyde Park Corner. The images were iconic, and knowledge of them suggested participation, a shared history. Possessing these images, being able to recognize these places, and 
most importantly, talk about them with the authority of an insider would surely produce a happy encounter with Britain. These early West Indian migrants arrived in Britain holding on to their preconceptions as tightly as they held on to their luggage. Over 50 years later now, many of these original pioneer migrants are still living in London. We know what these migrants expected because their testimony is preserved in audio archives and in documentary films. We also know what they expected because of the literature of the period. And perhaps the most evocative and brilliant example of this literature is the Trinidadian writer Samuel Salvon's novel, The Lonely Londoners, first published in 1956. Salvon's main character, Moses Alouetta, finds himself at the end of the novel, standing by the same river that I was now perched high above. Despite the evidence of discrimination, poverty, and heartbreak that Moses has been forced to endure throughout the book, at the end of the novel, our lonely Londoner is still unable to jettison his images of expectation. He stands gloriously still on the banks of the River Thames, knowing that he can't help but love this city that has effectively rejected him and his kind. And somewhat ironically, he comforts himself by lovingly recollecting London's iconic images and locales. Oh, he says, to have said, I walked on Waterloo Bridge, I rendezvoused at Charing Cross, Piccadilly Circus is my playground. To say these things, to have lived these things, to have lived in the great, great city of London, center of the world, to one day lean against the wind walking up the Bayswater Road, to see leaves swirl and dance and spin on the pavement, to write a casual letter home that begins last night in Trafalgar Square. Selvon's characters grapple with the symbolism of iconic London and the protracted and frustrating nature of their struggle suggests deep and unresolved issues around questions of belonging and ownership in the Britain of the period. On my second night, I sat out on the deck of Mr. Conrad's boat, and I looked down at the lights playing on the River Thames, and then I took out my copy of The Lonely Londoners, and I read the first few lines again, feeling the unease and the ambivalence in the words. One grim winter's evening, when it had a kind of unrealness about London, with a fog sleeping restlessly over the city and the lights showing in the blur, as if it's not London at all, but some strange place on another planet. That's it, exactly, I thought. That's it. Some strange place on another planet. For so many people, the possibility of their participating in the type of Britain that these buildings symbolically suggest remains for them about as real as the possibility of their participating in lunar exploration. It's not the fault of the buildings, of course, but it's what the buildings suggest. Exclusivity, privilege, power. Cumulatively, the evidence of the buildings forms a powerful narrative that for many can quickly move from a familiar one to a narrative of rejection. Even if one did take the time to learn the actual and symbolic meaning of this resplendent view of the city, the city might well still neither recognize you, let alone embrace you or take you in. Leeds and London are my cities. Over the past few years, I've obviously spent a great deal of time thinking about the story of David Olawale. And I've read and I've reread the work of Selvon many, many times. And this has led me to some kind of understanding of the plight of people who are best termed colonial migrants. For this is what both Olawale and Selvon were, as were my parents. My family arrived with the understanding that in an almost literal way, they were going home to Britain, the mother country, the center of the world. And as a result, their sense of expectation, their sense of excitement was high. 
much higher than it would be for a migrant who arrives in a country such as the United States of America for economic or political reasons. If things don't work out for colonial migrants, their sense of betrayal, their sense of outrage, if you like, or in the case of Selvon's characters, their sense of wistful melancholy is that much greater and much, much more painful. Colonial migrants are brought up to think that whatever the capital city of their countries might be, be it Lagos or Port of Spain, their real capital city is London. The real center of the world, of course, is Britain. This sense of expectancy will make such migrants absorb and soak up a tremendous amount of punishment and humiliation in the name of participation. My generation, the children of the pioneer colonial migrants to Britain, we were very, very different. We didn't trust Britain and we said, screw you to participation. As I said at the start of the talk, the evidence for this can be found in the street tr troubles or urban insurrections, if you like, that first flared up in the 70s and 80s, troubles which were exacerbated by the reactionary policies of Margaret Thatcher. We rebelled. We sought alternative homes, the Caribbean, or for the more essentialist Africa, neither Leeds nor London, nor for that matter, Manchester or Liverpool or Birmingham or Bristol, were really going to work for my generation. It was during this period of the late 70s and the 80s that I began to see Leeds and London as problematic cities that I just didn't have to be married to, that I didn't trust. And it's during this time that I was profoundly puzzled by the writing of those migrants, those old guys, who in the face of overwhelming evidence of rejection still, for some reason, professed a loyalty to Britain and her cities. But I now understand that for my parents and the other colonial migrants, for them to reject Britain would have been to reject a huge part of who they were. They were, in a sense, as colonial migrants, trapped. I owe a great deal to the people who went before me I still have ambivalence about the cities of Leeds and London and many other cities, but the least I can do, particularly so as a writer, is to honor the struggle of my antecedents by saying loud and clear that the only way you're going to see your city is by looking at it through the prism of me. And what's more, a large part of the success of any society is down to the efforts of people like me, the migrant. Like all migrants, I gave to you in terms of my energy, my ideas, my thoughts, my children. And whether you like it or not, I am now you. I say and I write this in the hope that new societies will eventually learn to include people like me in their vision of who they are. Because when all is said and done, that's what migrants need more than anything else, to be seen for who they are. This is the true beginning of inclusivity and change. Simply look at, see, and learn to recognize the people around you. And understand that their stories nearly always include you. Even stories as poignant and painful as the ones written by Samuel Selvon, who by the late 70s was so fatigued with the struggle to belong in Britain that he migrated a second time, this time to Canada, where he no longer felt that he had to sh shoulder the burdensome weight of being a colonial migrant. Economic migrant, political migrant, call him what you will. When Selvon walked down the streets of Toronto in the late 1970s, he walked with more ease than he ever did on the streets of London. Thank you. <coughs>
lot about colonial migrants, but were the migrants colonial mi migrants? There's been an intriguing history of succession of groups, and I'd like be intrigued to hear a little more about your explanation of succession groups of colonial migrants to breeds. So Indians, Pakistanis, West Indians, Africans, um, I think the the biggest uh, the biggest difference with the immigrants who came to Leeds from India or Pakistan um, or Bangladesh is that they arrived. Um, with a different language and a different religion, um, which immediately made them suspect um, because they had the temerity to flaunt a religion other than Christianity, um, and they had the temerity to speak a language other than English. Um, people from the Caribbean arrive essentially as English-speaking Christians. And as a teacher once told me, you're just like us, except you got left in the oven a bit longer, which wasn't a particularly helpful observation. <laughs> but uh, um, essentially, you know, the, the, the truth behind that is that there was less suspicion of West Indians than Indians and Pakistanis because of culture. You know, culture refracted through the lens of religion and language. So I, I, f I found that um, as a kid growing up, the Pakistani and Indian communities tend to be a little more insular than the West Indian communities. Uh, what that means today, I think, is uh, if you are a Thatcherite or if you are uh, subscribed to a kind of Darwini Darwinist uh, approach to social integration is that the economic success story of migrants tends to be located in the Indian and Pakistani community because they had to rely upon themselves from very early on and built quite strong communities economically. Um, whereas the West Indian community in many respects or the descendants of the West Indian community are still struggling I think socially with unemployment and with all the other social difficulties that face um, working class or lower middle class people in Britain today. So, I th you know, I think it was a the big difference was cultural. I wonder if you could uh, talk a little bit about V.S. Nightcall, who's one of whose books you wrote the film script for. And it, it seems that Nightcall falls into a certain category of colonial uh, migrants in that uh, he is coming to England, at, but he's coming from a place that he doesn't regard as home uh, because the, the empire moved people low over the world. And in the case of it, uh, uh, my father came from Trinidad, but his family was from India and had been moved there as indentured laborers uh, by, the, by the British in the first place. So he, he kind of was from Trinidad, but he wasn't really from Trinidad, and so he was displaced, you know, and then he comes to, to England and he's displaced everywhere he goes. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I could probably talk about Nepal for way too long. Uh, so, uh, but I mean, you've, you've hit the essential uh, uh, nail smack on the head. I mean, his double displacement, even before he arrived in Britain as a um, grandson uh, of Indian indentured laborers, that migration from India to Trinidad is a migration which cuts you off from the essential support system in the Indian community, which is the caste system, because you lose caste by crossing water. So he was already marooned when he arrived in Trinidad. His journey to Britain was slightly different from most migrants because he came on a scholarship to study at Oxford. So he was um, 
spared some of the indignity of the you know, working class people trying to get jobs and homes. So he was cocooned for a number of years, although the stresses of being a migrant, even as a scholarship boy at Oxford, did result in him having a nervous breakdown as a student. And there's a very interesting, uh, I thought, very revealing volume published about 12 years ago, which is the letters that he wrote to his father. Um, when he actually the first letters were written in New York because he traveled to England via New York. The first letters were written in from the Wellington Hotel on 58th Street in New York as a 17 year old kid to his father about his sense of being, his observations of New York en route to England. A profound sense of displacement I think followed him um, out of Trinidad and into the world, and it's fed his writing. He's also, as, as you obviously know, he's distanced himself quite um, carefully from any affiliation to anywhere. Trinidad, India, he's managed to sort of offend everybody. Uh, with, uh, so he's, the, the one group that still claim him, actually, uh, and do so with a great deal of pride, which is always shocking to me every time I go there, is Trinidadians. I mean, this is a man who got the Nobel Prize for Literature and thanked England. Uh, not the country where he grew up, not where he learned to read, not where he learned to write, not where he went to school. Um, but he says something to me about the dignity of Trinidadians and their ability to forgive that they're still prepared to take this individual into their midst and, and embrace and recognize him. Well, my, I'm not sure if I have an actual, uh, I tell you, my approach to writing is this, I, I, I would prefer not to write if I didn't have something to say. So my approach is don't do it unless I have something to say. And then the problems start, because the problem is not so much what do you have to say, it's how are you going to say it. It's always form. It's always structure. Um, it's, it's always a problem of shape. Um, and it, it, it boils down to the sentence, the paragraph, the chapter. What is the shape of this thing going to be? What is the tone of it going to be? So assuming that I have something to say or I think I've located um, something that I want to write about, then I tend to read a lot of books um, that have the shape or the structure that I think would suit whatever it is is on my mind. It's a bit like a carpenter. If you were going to build a table, you'd probably go and look at quite a few tables to give you some ideas and also to rule some things out. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a craft as much as anything else. Uh, and you, I think one has to be aware that uh, the best words in the best order. And there's usually somebody who's written a book or many authors who've written books before you who've done so better than you have or better than you might. And you will probably be well rewarded by going to read their books before you set out on your own journey. I'm wondering how, to what extent that might be true or not, and, and how you have 
dealt with those feelings that as you have gone, continue to go back and write about mm. Um, it's a good question. I don't have any bitterness towards Leeds or Britain at all. Uh, none, not, not even an iota. Um, you know, my way of dealing with feelings of frustration that are inevitable if you're growing up in a society that doesn't recognize you, um, and when it does see you, it sees you for less than what you are. Uh, I, I think I've been fortunate that I've had a, a way of dealing with that, which is to write myself into visibility. I have, a, I have a mechanism by which I can, um, I can place the experiences of people like me uh, or people who've had similar feelings of displacement, similar feelings have been um, misunderstood. I can do something with those experiences by ordering it, which is what stories do, you're ordering um, experience and I can utilize it. So I think I've been very lucky. I don't, I don't have any um, angst, bitterness, certainly no bitterness. I don't think you can write properly out of a sense of bitterness because you're trying to understand people all the time and you're trying to empathize with people and if, you know, bitterness suggests something that's slightly self-corrosive. Um, but having, having said all of that, there are a great number of people who don't know what to do with their frustration and don't know what to do with their anger and don't know where to put their despair at how they're treated every day at work or how they're treated when they try to ride public transport or they try to get a job or try to get a house or try to get their kid in a school. They don't have the luxury of being able to sit down and think about it and write a book about it and part of what um, I think part of what I feel my responsibility as a writer do is, as a writer is, is has always been to give a voice to those people whose stories are absent. Um, try to empathize with people who don't have the luxury of actually standing up and saying, but, 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 but. Um, so, you know, that's, that's partly what I think or hope that I'm doing. You know, I approached a David Olawale story because I knew if I didn't, nobody would, nobody would know. Um, so, yeah, and I don't, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but I go back to Leeds and I have the same ambivalent feelings about Leeds that I did as a kid. You know, I love Leeds uh, because I love the football team. I mean, we are absolutely useless at the moment, but I have helpless tribal loyalty to my team. Um, I look at this, those streets where I walked as a kid feeling very confused and sometimes quite unhappy, but you know what, that's, those are the cards I, I was dealt. That's the path I trod and I, you know, my job is not to turn my back on it, but it's to look at it hard and try and understand it so that another kid doesn't have to go through what I went through. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. You know, Britain has changed a lot. I mean, it, it's not it's not as um, it's not as hostile a country towards the outsider, depending who you are as an outsider. In a, in a sense, a lot of the difficulties that colonial migrants had to deal with during the you know my parents' generation and obviously my generation, their kids. A lot of those difficulties have been uh, reduced. It doesn't mean that the society is suddenly this wonderful, to the term which is used in this country a lot, post-racial, it definitely isn't. But what I'm saying is that the, the hostility and the distrust um, is now focused on other people. You know, you listen to the way in which people talk about um, uh, Muslims. You know, you could scratch out Muslim and just put in West Indian 40 years ago. It's the same ignorance that has been visited among the Islamic community. Um, 
It's the same ignorance that has been visited upon the community from Eastern Europe who are migrating into Britain at the moment. Um, the distrust, the fear, the nonsense in newspapers about, you know, all these Romanians who are flooding into our country, the thinly veiled nonsense about gypsies. And so there's still difficulties in the society, even if it's not focused on the colonial migrant at the moment. A lot of those, the distrust of the newcomer, a lot of the same language, a lot of the same mythology is being visited on different communities now. Um, West Indian community, you know, there's now a third generation, which is like my nephews and nieces who are at college um, and are leaving college, and no doubt there'll be a generation soon after them. They don't have the uh, problems of assimilation and participation that we had. You know, they're the, you know, this is even a generation on from you guys. They, they're the Spice Girls generation, you know, they. They, they're the generation that look at the England football team and see that half the faces are non-white. They look at the British track and field team at the Olympics. They look at, they, they see multicultural, multiracial Britain. We didn't see it. We didn't see that. Um, they see it, they're not as anxious. Um, but that also means, I have to say, that sometimes I worry that they're not as vigilant about some of the comments about other communities as well. Um, and it, I find it kind of distressing when I hear casual prejudice being used by people who should know better, to put it that way. Um, you mean return migrant to the Caribbean? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's very hard for people to go back to where they've come from because the places that they're returning to um, often haven't changed as quickly as they've changed. So, you know, I know from having taught in the Caribbean and University of the West Indies in Barbados, from having lived in St. Kitts a couple of times over the last 20 years, um, there's a lot of what they call returnees who've tried to restitch their lives back into the Caribbean after, 20, after 30, 40 plus years in Britain. And it's very, very hard for them because they've got used to um, They've got used to certain ways of doing things. They've got used to certain ways of thinking, certain opportunities, certain facilities at their fingertips. It's very hard for them to return. And the frustration that they have is that society has not changed as quickly as they've changed. Um, so it, I just think it's, I, I can't remember, I wrote once, there's, when you look out the back of a boat and you see um, the path in the water um, that is left. If you blink and look back, there's no longer a path. It's not there. You can't actually go back, I don't believe, uh, once you've migrated. It's very, very tough uh, to go back and to replant yourself um, and, re -ex and explain who you are. Uh, people find it hard to... Um, People find it hard to do that. And I'm not just talking about colonial migrants, I'm talking about the larger issue of returnees I, I've written about with people from the African diaspora world, particularly Americans, African Americans going to live in Africa. Um, and I spent a great deal of time with African Americans who are trying to live in Africa, particularly West Africa and Ghana. Um, it's frustrating um, watching people trying to make a home in a place that has 
a historical significance in their mind as home with a capital H. And then, of course, I've sat in, coming back to Naipaul, I've sat in India talking to Trinidadians who've left Trinidad and gone to try and live in India because it's their historical home and that's not worked either. So I'm sure there are plenty of examples of people who can go home, who can reverse that migration and reconnect, but I've never seen it as um, anything other than a very difficult and um, problematic attempt to reconnect. That's a word. <laughs> yeah. Um, how we get fragmentized among immigrants and especially among colonial migrants. And I'm interested in since you were, you were talking about how the first generation, the um, the migrants, fully migrants that came to London, how they were desperate to be a part of the narrative. And you as a child migrant, your generation even the desire, even the need to be mm -hmm. So I was wondering about the generations after the colonial migrants and how they identify with the um, with the West Indian culture of the It's a very it's a very good question. I hope I, I hope I can answer it properly. Um, this the children, my generation, didn't really know that much about the West Indies because one of the things about first generation migrants is that they often want to protect their children from rooting themselves in any romanticism about where they have come from. So um, they're very keen that their children should be a part of this society that they've come to. So they don't want to spend a lot of time um, filling their heads with um, the idea that there's an alternative home for them somewhere. I'm talking about Britain now. America is a slightly different case with this because America has the hyphen. Um, you can be an Irish American, a Swedish American, a Jewish American, an African American. The hyphen is very important. There is no hyphen in Britain. You can't be an uh, Irish Britain or a Swedish Britain or a Jewish Britain, there's no hyphen. You're this or you're that. So knowing that this is a situation, people like my parents didn't really tell us very much about the Caribbean. Um, and I know this from talking to lots of friends my own age and, uh, who had a similar experience. You go home from school, somebody's called you a name in the playground, they've told you to go back to where you come from. You turn on the TV, there's Enoch Powell, a politician, tell it, say all these people should go back to where they come from. And eventually, at a certain point, you say to your mom or your dad, where did we come from? And they say, you come from right here. Don't let anybody tell you any different because they're trying to re-inscribe in you a sense of belonging in this new country. That's what they crossed the water for. Um, so, it builds up a, a kind of confusion and a resentment, obviously, at a certain point, and then a search to find another place. Um, and often that means looking at the Caribbean for those whose parents came from there, almost looking past your parents at it, if possible. Um, and a big help for my, my generation were helped enormously uh, by Bob Marley, by the rise of reggae in the 70s, which became for us a huge cultural calling card because, of course, you go to see, you go to see Peter Tosh or you go to see Jimmy Cliff, and there's a whole bunch of white kids from your school there as well. It was something that unified you, but it was kind of culturally yours.